chair of the City Club's Forum Board and producer of today's program. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the Sentinel Hotel, where thousands of people are watching, listening in, and participating by radio, TV, and online. Listeners are here via X-Ray FM's website and radio stations, 107.1 and 91.1 FM. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. And TV viewers will watch a recording of today's program via Open Signals community media television stations. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing Friday Forum to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partners, our volunteers and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. Last fall during Hurricane Irma, many critical health facilities being run by nonprofits did not have the essential medicines on hand or generators ready to kick in when the power went out. It was a reminder to communities across the country that nonprofits deliver vital services to many groups of people, including the most vulnerable among us. Federal government entities and critical health care facilities are now mandated to do continuity of operations plans, and most governments have complied. But one part of the equation is often overlooked. Nonprofits, many of which are grant funded, rarely get funding for emergency planning or training. Here in Oregon, we know a major earthquake is coming. If it happens tomorrow, will our most vulnerable residents be able to access the basic services they rely on? Joining us to help identify the roots of the problem and to offer solutions are Grace Chicoto Schultz, Assistant Professor in the Department of Public Administration at the Mark O. Hatfield School of Government at Portland State University. Carrie Kazuki, Director of Management Consulting and Services at 501 Commons. Chris Voss, Director of Emergency Management for Multnomah County. And Jim White, Executive Director of the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. Moderating the discussion is Dr. Ann Castleton, a community planner and emergency manager at the City of Portland. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Greetings. I don't uh, expect that anybody in this room would be shocked to hear the news that we're expecting a mega earthquake, and hopefully no one on the radio. But. I think it's very likely, people think it's very likely that we will all survive, but our roads, our bridges, our buildings, our energy pipelines, our water mains, and our sewer systems, that may be a completely different story. Uh, and we're going to have a big mess on our hands to clean up when that happens. So nearly two years ago, City Club um, released uh, its Earthquake Resiliency Report, and it was overwhelmingly endorsed by City Club. Um, some of the original researchers are sitting at that table right there in the middle, shout out. Um, and to follow on from that report, there were 14 recommendations. It was decided to form a city club advocacy committee. And uh, those members at the table are also on that committee, as am I. Um, and we are happy to report that four of the recommendations have been implemented. Seven are in process. Uh, one was tabled and two have not uh, been started yet. But the one that we're here to talk about today is uh, number 12, which, is, which reads, metro area governments that contract with nonprofit service providers should use the contracting process and periodic audits to require nonprofits to have continuity of operations plans. So this recommendation kind of uses the stick approach. And as our subcommittee was discussing how best to get this to happen, we really also felt that in order for nonprofits to achieve it, since I think it's pretty clear that they would do this if they could, um, 
that we'd also need some carrots in terms of resources and expertise. So, our, so we organized this discussion today to kind of bring some of those issues to the fore, to shed light on the current uh, status of nonprofits in terms of their emergency planning and examine ways to encourage and support them so that they can deliver the services that are going to be needed in an emergency. So we want to kind of today address ideas for how to fund and support this especially, which is one of the big uh, challenges of this work. Um, and we have uh, Carrie Kazuki here from Seattle. Uh, they, there's a group there, 501 Commons, that has been doing this work in Seattle, so they have some experience doing this. So it is well known amongst emergency responders that the most vulnerable groups during disasters are communities of color. There are other disadvantaged groups both within and outside of that, uh, people that are very old, uh, children that are very young, uh, refugees, people with limited English proficiency. There are a number of vulnerable groups. And, but many of these people rely on government-funded human and social services for really essential life-saving services like health care, uh, affordable housing, mental health services, adult daycare. So Oregon's counties funnel state and federal funds to nonprofits to provide those essential services, and they do this via contracts. So continuity of operations planning, which in government lingo we call this COOP. Um, it's the process of thinking through for each specific agency what essential services must be continued um, to clients or customers after a major disruption. So this planning process kind of discusses things like, will our building stand up? Do we have an alternate facility? What staff are we going to need to implement these essential functions? What about the supply chain? Where's our data stored? Uh, uh, you know, uh, really nitty gritty kind of questions. Um, all the aspects of how an agency would go about continuing these essential services. So the city bureaus and the county have been engaging in this process over the last few years. But as Bobby said, that is really only part of the picture. Because let's just say in the best of all possible worlds, the earthquake waits long enough for the city and county to be completely prepared um, and ready and practiced. If we haven't worked with nonprofits, creating link linkages and setting expectations and supporting training and planning, we will be missing one of the most crucial um, partners in our recovery. So with that background, I want to start by asking Grace a question. She, um, and with the cooperation of Jim and the Nonprofit Association, uh, did a 1918 Oregon uh, survey of Oregon nonprofits focusing on emergency preparedness. So Grace, will you tell us a little bit about the survey, what it covered, what the focus was, what your motivation was behind it? Yes, well, thank you for having us here. Uh, we did this survey uh, back in uh, last year, and we concluded it in May of last year. Um, and I'll start off with the motivation based on what Anne just started talking about, uh, why focus on nonprofit organizations. And uh, really, it has to do with two things. Number one, nonprofit organizations are the ones that are providing services to the, those that are vulnerable in our communities, low income in, in our communities, um, uh, those that are marginalized in our communities, those are hard to reach uh, pe po populations uh, in our communities as well. And so if they are not prepared and they don't survive any hazard or any disaster, then what happens to those people that they are, they are serving? So, um, and then, the second piece is response is not the only thing that nonprofit organizations can do, right? They can advocate for more funding. They can represent the, the, those communities that they're serving because they know what their, their needs are. They know what's likely to happen to them if a major disaster is going to happen. For the most part, they're going to be the ones that are pushed far back, are going to be even worse off um, after, after a disaster. So those were really like the primary motivation. So for us to talk about community readiness for disaster, we cannot have that conversation without talking about nonprofit organizations. And one of the things that we've come to realize too is when it comes to recovery, they are really a bigger part in recovery long after formal disaster uh, people have left, particularly in those communities um, that we're talking about. Um, so our survey focused on a number of things. Number one, are you aware of, of any hazard in your community? Do you have that knowledge? Um, Internally, what are you doing to plan for it? Are you providing any training? It could be just education or drills that you provide 
for not just your staff, but also for your clients. Um, do you have any informal or formal response agreements with other organizations? Because I think for nonprofits, there's a tendency to look inward and just say, oh, it's just us that have to do this. But you have other partners that you can partner with uh, to, do that, to do that. And then we also looked at what actions are you taking just to protect life, right? For your clients that are going to come to, you, to, your, uh, to your office, for your staff and volunteers that are working there, what have you put in place to protect their life? And then what have you done to protect your building, right? So, you know, we, we can talk about con continuity planning. If you don't have a building and all your people are, I don't want to say, you know, dead, but they're <laughs> injured and they're not there, your continuity plan is not going to do anything for you because you've not done some very basic things that you, ne you need to do. And then what resources have you put aside? And this is where continuity planning comes in. What resources have you put aside? What planning have you done to help you start to cope with a disaster after it's happened. So we sent out our survey um, through uh, the Nonprofit Association of Oregon, through PSU's Nonprofit Institute, uh, and other various uh, community partners, and we re got responses from 189 nonprofit organizations. The majority of these were health and human service nonprofit organizations. There were about 79%, uh, 56% of those, uh, mostly in Multnomah County, in Lane County, as well as in Washington County. Um, and I'll, take a, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what our findings were. You know, no, do tell us what some of the research findings were. What are nonprofits the least engaged in and the most engaged in? What are the challenges? Absolutely. Well, because nonprofit organizations rely on funding mostly from other entities to support their, their programs, we, we're kind of not surprised that they're investing more in those, those actions that are on the cheaper side. Uh, both in terms of funding and also in terms of just human resources, right? So just finding out what the hazard is that is likely to affect their region, they're doing a lot of that, and, I, and, I, and that's easy. They're attending meetings, they're consulting media, um, they're obtaining information specifically about the big one uh, that's going to happen. So that's like 81% of people that are consulting media, 76 of the nonprofit organizations are at least attending a meeting, a talk, a discussion. We have 72 that have specifically sought information about Cascadia, but when it comes to information about whether their particular building is going to be affected, we see the numbers drop, and that drops down to half mm -hmm. of the, and these are what I'm talking about, are just health and human service organizations. It drops to half. So in other words, some of us- They have general sitting, information, yes. but not specific. Not even a general, yes, and then we're sitting in this building and we have absolutely no idea how vulnerable we, we mm -hmm. could be. Um, and then another missed opportunity that we're seeing is that they are distributing information to their staff and volunteers, but not to clients in terms of, you know, yes, you're coming to our offices and we are aware that there's a, a disaster that might affect us, but we're not going to share with you. We're just going to share this with our clients. I mean, we're just going to share this with volunteers. So a missed opportunity where we can just at least start to educate the communities that we're serving about the, the risks that we, we face. Then the second area we are, they're doing r relatively well is placing things internally or planning internally about how their organization might respond, um, and then some training. Um, but again, what about continuity planning? Is oh, it? I'll, I'll get to continuity okay. planning. <laughs> so, 85% um, have discussed the potential disaster in a meeting. Right? Easy. We can sit down. We can do this. Right? We're doing it right now. Um, and then 74 have developed an evacuation plan. I think that's kind of relatively easy too, right? We can just sit yeah. down, draw where the exits, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And then 68 are providing education and training to their staff, right? But again, we're not doing that to our clients. And then the, the, the least thing that nonprofit are, are doing, nonprofit organizations are doing, is those actions that are geared towards um, agreements to share resources with other organizations in the event of a disaster happening, uh, getting into some collaborative partnerships with, with emergency management organizations. So only 29% of health and human service organizations have entered into some informal or formal agreement with the city, the county, the state, the federal government, just how we're going to collaborate to respond, 29%. Wow. You know, um, and then the other thing that we're, which is kind of surprising is we need for organizations to set aside 
resources that will help them respond in the event that the, the disaster happens, right? So we're talking stockpiling. Um, the good things we're doing, we're 16, 68% of organizations have obtained first aid supplies. That's good. Another 69 have established communication protocols for their staff to say, hey, this is how we're going to operate, this is how we're going to reach you because we're going to need to continue to provide services. However, 46%, less than half, have an emergency kit. And 68% have not made any transportation plans, none whatsoever, for their staff or their clients. So if we're talking about your, your uh, clients that have disabilities, that rely on you to come and pick them up, to bring, bring, bring you to their bring them mm -hmm. to, to your center, they're stuck. You have not thought, they've, they've not thought about that. And then this is surprising, half of the health and human service organizations have put aside any emergency food and water. Wow. So. Thank you, wow. I mean, that's quite telling. Yeah. But your question about continuity planning, there's <laughs> some good news and not, you know, not, not so good news with, um, with continuity planning. Um, I will say, let me find my notes here. So less than half, 48% of health and human service organizations have a continuity plan in place. Wow, but that's pretty impressive that half do have something they call a continuity right. plan. Right, that's great. Yep. Let me, let's go to Chris now. Uh, Chris is the head of emergency management at Multnomah County. So you don't directly supervise all of these health and human services contracts, but you would be working with everybody when we uh, responding. And Chris, also, you, you were in New York after Sandy or something. You have some of your own experience. Uh, I, I did spend us. a lot of time on, on the East Coast. Uh, but first, I want to I thank uh, City Club for sort of hosting this uh, wonderful event and everybody for coming. Thank you. Uh, it's an important conversation for us. I'm fortunate that it's a conversation that I have all the time, so uh, I've got a lot of understanding in this area. Uh, there's actually one thing I wanted to talk about, sort of agreements mm -hmm. and, and informal agreements. Um, you know, hearing that 29%, that's, that's some time of a concern, but I would say that one of the other organizations that a lot of nonprofits should be communicating with and maybe creating those informal agreements with, it just might be your competitors. And I know that's a hard thing to say, but guess what? If you have another organization that's doing like work, it might just be that they are in the best position to support similar work if you can't do it. And so sometimes those type of informal conversations are very, very important. Um, the county does not have a hospital. Uh, so if a hospital has an issue, guess what? They're communicating with the other hospitals and sort of uh, sharing those patients. Important to remember. So, um, uh, you know, I, I want to tell a quick story. It's only going to take about, you know, 30 or 40 seconds. And it kind of puts some of this in perspective for us. Um, you know, I used to whitewater raft. And the first time ever went whitewater rafting, uh, they told, said, hey, if you fall out of the boat, put your feet up, float down water, and wait to be rescued. We're going we're gonna to throw you this rope, or we're going to catch up with the boat, and, and you're going to be OK, or we're going to pull you in, and then you know, wait to be rescued. That was, that was the lesson you learned. So fast forward an hour later, sure enough, I find myself in the water. I'm thrown out of the boat. I look behind me. Everybody else is in the water, and the boat's 15 feet behind them upside down. It's that point in time that you realize the wait to be rescued plan is not always fantastic. <laughs> the question that we have is what responsibility do each of us have to put ourselves in a position so that we could rescue ourselves? Uh, maybe that's the other folks around us. Maybe it's, <laughs> it's another boat. Maybe it's, hey, if you fall out of the boat, swim back towards the boat. Don't just float down the river. Uh, so I've seen this play over you know, during many, many emergencies. So uh, in Superstorm Sandy in the D.C. area, uh, Hurricane uh, Isabel, um, I rent shelters for Katrina, her, after Hurricane Katrina. But probably the biggest disaster, the most catastrophic one we had to deal with, especially in the area of human services, was a four-foot snowstorm that we had. Four feet of snow. And suddenly, every road was not passable. A third of the county lost power. Uh, including a lot of the water pumping stations so people didn't have water. Uh, guess what, if you have a bundled service at your home with your, your cable, your phone, your internet, you lost that too. Uh, so suddenly, there were a lot of groups that needed help. Um, and all those groups that supported everything from transportation, human services, you know, uh, getting people to dialysis, every one of them was reaching out to the county for assistance. Um, and, and 
here it is in the, there's two parts of this lesson. One, uh, we had to prioritize what we were gonna do because we couldn't help everybody. Life safety came first. So, you know, if you think about power restoration, it went hospitals, nursing homes, you know, 911 centers, uh, large assisted living facilities, and it worked all the way down to sort of individual households. But that took weeks to get there. So if you're on the back end, guess what? You may need to do some work to sort of prepare yourself. And, and there are a lot of businesses out there that probably will be in the middle. So that might be some time before you receive that help. Uh, but the other thing that we learned, because uh, we had another major event a few years later, was it was amazing how after that one snowstorm, when we started calling down organizations during the next event, and they're just like, you know what? After that last event, we bought a generator. After that last event, we sat down and created a plan where our employees could work from home. After that last event, and so suddenly, that one event forced them all to do some planning that they had never done before. And you know, planning can be robust. You could spend a lot of time on it. Uh, not every organization needs the same robust exercises or robust planning. But what we do want you to have is continuous improvement. Every time one of those events happen, small or large, it could just be a power outage, sit down, have that conversation, and decide, if we had to go through this one again, how could we do this better? What equipment, what personnel change, facility, you name it, maybe it's insurance. Um, there's a whole lot of things that you could do, probably, um, but they will take some actions, and they start with that conversation amongst your employees, and sometimes your clientele as well. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me just add a question onto that. So as the county's prioritizing its disaster plans, where do nonprofits fit in? What will you be looking to them to do? Uh, so this very much depends on the type of event that we have. So uh, you know, I, I spent all morning with, uh, I spent a portion of my morning today at Mercy Corps, uh, where we were working on a program uh, related to sheltering uh, after a catastrophic event. That specifically, that program is about uh, training people that don't have previous training, we call it sort of just-in-time training, and how people would walk into shelters, get some training, and then we immediately could put them to work. And if you look at the Cascadia subduction zone and the modeling, we know that we're probably looking that we might have to shelter 80 or 90,000 people. To get there, if you use the Red Cross modeling on how many people you need to provide that sheltering, it's about 13,000 people. So I need 13,000 people to shelter the other 90,000 people. Multnomah County doesn't have 13,000 people. Uh, so we know that that's gonna come from a lot of our partners. And it might just come from you know, citizens uh, that don't have a lot of expertise, but there are some other critical areas where we wanna partner and work with organizations that have more experience in those areas. We start with the Red Cross and then we, we work our way down to sort of uh, maybe folks without any experience in that area. Thank you. Um, for our radio audience, I just want to say this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Ann Castleton. I'm an emergency manager with the City of Portland. I'm speaking with Grace Chicoto schultz from Portland State University, Carrie Kazuki from 501 Commons, Chris Voss from Multnomah County, and Jim White from the Nonprofit Association of, of Oregon. So Jim, you're up. I know you work. <laughs> I know you worked with Grace on the nonprofit survey, and I know before that you have a lot of emergency response experience with Mercy Corps all over the world. Will you tell us a little bit more about what's unique about Oregon nonprofits and how you're using this survey? Sure, thank you, Ann, and thanks again to the City Club for putting this event on. This is hugely important, and I hope that we can draw more attention to what we're gonna need to do to respond to an eventual earthquake. It is going to happen. Um, we, we partnered with Grace and with PSU on putting this um, research forward and what I wanted to do is kind of create a little bit of a context on what nonprofits in Oregon look like. There are over 20,000 charitable benefit organizations in Oregon. That includes everything from these health and human service organizations that do a lot of work with Chris's folks, with the Portland City, with other folks, but also there are a lot of organizations that are doing, um, you know, their, their education organizations, churches, spiritual uh, sanctuaries, those all play important roles as well in an emergency. And when those organizations are disrupted and don't have a plan, that means that people are not going to get their services, whether those services are 
you know, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the most fundamental, the food, the shelter, the water, the clothing, but they also need a lot of other services. There's going to be um, pretty serious psychological trauma to the community. And as Anne let off at the beginning there, there, there is going to be particularly those most vulnerable groups are going to need a lot of additional assistance that these nonprofits have very direct and real connection to these communities. Because we, as private organizations that work for public good, we are of the community. We don't have the same sort of restrictions that government may have on how you work with community. And, and we can be mobilizing people in a very different way to help each other and help the government in the response that's going to be needed. Um, the vast majority of nonprofits in Oregon, and it's true here in Multnomah County and Portland, they're very small. You know, you, you think of the large ones when you think of the kinds of services that are going to be needed right after an earthquake, but over 70% of the nonprofits in Oregon are less than $100,000 in annual revenue and expenditures. So those organizations, I, I think it would be really a mistake if we were to sort of brush them aside as having some type of a role in this kind of an event. And they're often the ones who don't have a lot, pretty much any background in how to respond. And as Chris was saying, these are often the type of people that, you know, when you need 13,000 people to help respond and house um, people who are now internally displaced, those organizations already have at least some kind of programming and some kind of mission alignment to be of service. And so I think um, what we're going to need to do is continue to really push hard to get the resources available to these kinds of organizations so that they can better be a part of the response. Grace, do you want to jump in? Just, just something Jim said, you know, in, in terms of this, um, the nonprofit sector and who are the, the, the largest groups that are operating in the communities, focusing on the small nonprofit organizations. One thing I will say about our survey is we heard more from larger nonprofit organizations, a million and up, than we did from small organizations. So if these numbers are something we can celebrate, we probably shouldn't, right? Because yeah. they have the resources to implement you know, measures that we're talking about. And even if they do, they're not doing very well. What more the nonprofit organizations that are bringing in less than 100,000 a year? Yeah, right? thank you, Grace. Well, Jim, if we just follow up with that, what do you think the priority is for your nonprofits? Uh, and, or actually, let's think about some organizations that fund nonprofits, which is local government and also charitable organizations. What, c what could we be doing more? What should they be doing to help with this? Well, I think, um, you know, when, when Chris was talking earlier, and he may be able to touch on this more, is that the recognition of these organizations as critical civic infrastructure, and that's a very particular term, because it allows for some types of federal monies to be made available, um, there, there, are, there is a need for especially those larger, again, bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs organizations, to be able to have direct access very quickly to funds so they're going to be able to, to work. That might mean prior agreements in place with the federal government or with um, local government, and I know there are limitations around how that might work, but it's really important that there are plans in place when as Chris mentioned, the, the raft overturns and there's nobody to throw the actual lifeline to the person who fell out. Um, that's what we're facing when we're looking at this kind of, a, of an enormous disaster. You know, we had direct experience, and I'm drawing from a lot of, responding around the world to a lot of different earthquake scenarios, where we, at, when, back when I was at Mercy Corps, we would oftentimes need to either rely on a partner organization to help in our response, or we would be housing the nonprofits, NGOs from other organizations in our facility because our facility wasn't badly, as badly damaged in an earthquake or in, 
in some kind of a, a, a zone that was no longer available for um, programming. So, uh, you know, just to back up what Chris was saying is having, having these relationships across organizations is going to be vital. The last point, and I know you probably want to move on, is I, I really want to make is there is an important role that these independent organizations can play that government cannot. Mm -hmm. We have a special relationship with community that does not require us to meet some of the same things that government has to do. We should remember that FEMA and ICE are both in Homeland Security. So when we're responding as private organizations with private funds, remember, our money is not only through contracts with government or, con or, or um, grants from foundations, but it's private individuals like the people in this room and listening to this broadcast who can help nonprofits to respond. We, w we respond in emergencies with the humanitarian imperative, which is anyone deserves assistance, period. Thank you. Chris, did you want to jump in? Uh, two things about uh, money. Uh, I get asked a lot of these questions after an emergency. I uh, want to use an example of the Eagle Creek Fire. Many of those businesses, the difference between them doing very well as a result of that event or, or surviving, I should say, after the event and the ones that were not surviving, insurance. That's really, really important for those businesses. And two, there are a lot of nonprofits that will be eligible under the Stafford Act for dollars. What you're eligible for will depend. Uh, but I think there's a misconception that, one, it will be for more than you think, and two, the speed at which those dollars arrive. Eagle Creek was a year and a half ago. Multnomah County made a claim for Eagle Creek uh, a year and a half later. We still have not received one single penny. So the time at which that reimburse happens is really, really quite long as well. And so as a business, you have to think about that when you're looking at sort of the dollars and then how you're keeping your company going. Thanks, Chris. Carrie, um, I, when, Carrie is from 501 Commons, which is a nonprofit in, uh, based in Washington State, though I think now you're coming to Portland. But uh, when we were first researching what to do about this uh, recommendation and how ways that we could get it implemented, and I had some ideas, we came across 501 Commons and found out they serve nonprofits in Washington State, and we found out that they had actually implemented emergency preparedness and continuity planning through a program that they have and that they've developed. So, and we hope you're bringing it to Portland. Um, so tell us a little bit about that program and how it worked and how it got funded. Sure, and thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the City Club for uh, inviting 501 Commons. We appreciate it. Uh, just want to uh, repeat, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, We've just started hiring staff in Portland, and we have one colleague here today uh, that's with me. Um, so your question is really about our Prepare, Respond, Serve program. Um, so that was, that's a program that was developed over several years at, at 501 Commons, and it's really a two-fold um, framework. Uh, one, it is an organization-wide framework, uh, and that's very important to consider as an organization. Oh, go ahead. I just want to say that for people that don't know, 501 Commons is an organization that gives support to nonprofits, that right. does training and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So that's the purpose, and you do it in a lot of areas. Yes, we do. Including this. Okay. So, um, yes, so we have an organization-wide framework that, that we developed in Prepare, Response, Serve. I'm just going to call it PRS uh, from now on. Um, and We've, we've learned that it's very important for an organization to articulate broadly what its response is going to be in times of emergency because, um, and this is especially true for uh, direct service organizations, that uh, the organization really needs to define who um, they're going to respond to as a priority, who is most vulnerable, and what services are going to be available because I, it, it's pretty important to articulate that and we call that an emergency mission statement. Um, now, back to, the, back to the planning on the tactical side, it, our framework really differentiates between direct service organizations like food banks or uh, emergency uh, organizations that, that um, disperse emergency money uh, to also housing 
for seniors, for example, or, or other populations. Um, those, you know, the plans can really get pretty intricate. We, we go into things like gas shutoffs, water shutoffs, um, how we get food if there's a food program because people still need to be fed. Um, I think somebody else pointed out earlier that you have to articulate who are you, what facility are you going to send people to if your facility is not functional? So having those partnerships in the community is important. Now I think you, Anne, you asked about funding. Funding. Fund, <laughs> funding is always really rough for this. Um, we've learned that there's a flurry of interest right after a catastrophic event, but that interest really diminishes pretty quickly uh, on the part of funders. Um, I think the funding question is around raising awareness, letting, letting funders know that this is a priority, and I think as Jim pointed out, um, our nonprofits, especially the, the direct service nonprofits, need to continue to serve these vulnerable communities. Um, we, did, we did another project about a year and a half ago nearby in Clark County, Washington, where we did um, emergency planning for five um, locations of Vancouver Housing Authority. And that one, we, we did that with some volunteer consultants for the most part, and we were eligible to give away volunteer generation funds, which are federal funds. But that is, that is an exception rather than the rule. Usually when we're doing this kind of work, it is funded by the nonprofit itself. Okay, and so you, they, you have a consultant that comes in and they pay a prorated fee, like how does them, that work? As far as the funding or the actual provision of services? Well, if I, if I as a nonprofit, I'm gonna have to pay for help, how, how do you organize it? Well, we have a set, we have a set pricing kind of a protocol for that. I mean, we, we go in with the assumption that we don't have funding. Um, since we're nonprofit ourselves, the, the fees are quite reasonable, but it's intensive. Uh, a lot of these emergency plans are 50 to 85 pages per location because it goes through everything, every form of pre preparedness to from what we call go kits, where there's yep. there are containers full of food and emergency supplies for residents to, like I said earlier, emergency shutoffs. Uh, if you if you're a housing organization, it's very important to have an updated plan of who is in which unit, what mobility challenges they might have, et cetera, um, what other health challenges they might have, it, and that needs to be updated uh, pretty frequently. Do, so is this a six-month process or a year-long process? Um, our prepare response serve is, a, my, what I would say, probably about a three- to six-month process. Um, it, it depends on the scale of the organization. We're talking to some relatively big organizations here in the Northwest that want everything done. But for a, for a housing facility, for a single, single one, it might be one or two months to go through everything and, and to put a plan together. And I, I should add, it's very collaborative as well. We work directly with the facility management. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I have at least 10 more questions for each of you, but um, <laughs> instead of that, I'm going to say that for our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's uh, Friday Forum. I'm Ann Castleton, Emergency uh, Manager for the City of Portland. I'm speaking with Dr Grace Chicoto schultz from Portland State University, Carrie Kazuki from 501 Commons, Chris Voss from Multnomah County Emergency Management, and Jim White from the Nonprofit Association of Oregon. So we're going to go to the audience now for some questions. Everybody that's watching or listening is welcome to ask a question. Uh, if you've written a question on an index card, I think some magical person will collect that and will magically hand it to me. Um, and also things are, I think, submitted via Twitter. Uh, what I do want to remind you is all City Club members are welcome to ask a question. Please identify yourself and really keep it to a short question so that we can pick the brains of our panel even more. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Some years ago. <coughs> and can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> excuse me. Paul Milius, City Club member. Some years ago, FEMA recognized that 
in any big disaster, the first responders are really your neighbors, people right, who are right there. So they start, form community emergency response teams uh, and uh, certs, and here in Portland, they're called neighborhood emergency teams. I, I'm, I'm on one. Has there been any effort to connect the net, neighborhood emergency teams with the not-for-profits, perhaps with the idea of training some of their workers to be first responders and have the kits and so on. I mean, I have a backpack full of stuff that I would haul out and bring with me uh, in the case of an emergency and so on. So we have somebody in the audience that works with the net team. Is this okay to me to just call out? Glenn, can you speak to that? Yes. So the answer is yes. Spoken by Glenn Devitt from the uh, Portland Emergency Team. And I think um, in addition to working with NETS, there's a lot of work going on at the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, uh, outreach to, to um, these vulnerable communities, some of whom may not have the time and space to be a NET volunteer, but need to be supported and trained. And that work is happening, which it's very exciting. Wynn Wakala, City Club member. I was my neighborhood watch coordinator leader in Washington County, and we also had the thing where you had the garbage can full of stuff and knew where the doctors were in your community and stuff. So part of my question was the same thing. I hope this goes to all the counties, but I also wonder how much work you do with Janus Youth, like the Yellow Brick program, to help the people that are homeless, how to reach to them. Sure. Do you have anybody that can speak to that, Chris? Can you? Uh, uh, no, I don't. Obviously, uh, through the, the there within the county is the Joint Office for Homeless Services that might have sort of better connections with, the groups, with the, some of those groups. But I can tell you that we work with, you know, many many you know nonprofits. A lot of departments also will work with the ones that are sort of operational. So you know, I mentioned Mercy Corps, Red Cross, you know, uh, the Seventh Day Adventists that sort of do a lot of work with donations and volunteer. There are a lot of these groups that we work with that support sort of our internal core missions. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the city already working, uh, Joint Us Homeless Services working with that group. We had somebody here from Transition Projects, but I don't see him now. So he could probably answer that better. Uh, Bill Dickey, City Club member. I, <clears throat> I was thinking about these small nonprofits and as a vendor that services them I noticed that, well, for example, Mercy Corps is in an old building in uh, Old Town, but it's been uh, earthquake proofed. It's been renovated over the years. But <clears throat> a lot of these small nonprofits are in seven or eight story buildings in downtown Portland that are, uh, you know, 80, 100 years old that haven't been upgraded. And I'm wondering what the city is doing as far as uh, advising on these older buildings that might need evacuation plans or. Uh, you know, things like that. What the city is doing, advising on these, so there isn't a representative from the city here, except but, uh, for me, I, I, I think, but <laughs> who I does think work I, for building development services. Yeah, you know, I, I want to sort of answer this question from uh, the perspective, every one of these organizations is very, very different. So knowing what your organization does and what they might be responsible for after that emergency, the facility you're in should be part of that conversation. What I know is that a lot of times those conversations aren't short-term conversations. It's like, hey, you know what? We were one person and then we became three and now we're seven and, and we do even more now. But you know, it's not a situation now where if, if something happened, I could just retreat back to my home and support the whole organization from that one location. Maybe now we need to think about the facility we're in and l look to see like, hey, I could tell you that um, if you've seen the modeling, uh, locations in the you know northwest part of the city, you know, will see greater shake coefficients than southeast after a major earthquake. But they could take all of that into consideration, and I think it's about choosing the facilities that they think work best for them to support the mission they have. Um, you know, personally, I don't think there's one size fits all there um, because they might also have three locations, and maybe one of those locations will be better than the other two. But we, what I do think is important that each of those organizations have that conversation, mm -hmm. ask it among them, amongst themselves, and then find and make the and do the long-term planning to put themselves in a position where they'll be more reliable, more redundant, and more likely to be operational after an event. Grace, you wonder? Yeah, um, f from the survey that we did, uh, only 10% of 
health and human service organizations reported having retrofitted their buildings. And when you look at the numbers in terms of only just 10%, um, and when you look at um, how many of those nonprofits actually own their building, there were 30 of those that own the building, and only eight have ret retrofitted their building. Mm -hmm. So we have an issue of the nonprofits that are renting a facility, or they actually own a facility. And you're absolutely right, having that conversation about how secure your building is and does it actually need to be retrofit? And did you have data on whether people knew about their building? Like if they had knowledge? We, uh, we, we had a question, um, and the numbers again were pretty low. Have people you that actually have, knew had researched yeah, it. Yeah, in, in other words, have you actually invited somebody, an expert, to come and assess your building? Very few nonprofits have, have done that. It's, I think one of the important thing part of kind of operation planning is also having an alternative building. So it may not even be a necessity that you, is there somewhere else you can go or someone else you have an agreement with that you could support those operations? So um, that's all part of that type of planning. Yeah, could, that could, you, could you provide your essential service in a partnership with somebody else whose building stands? Colin. Hi, I'm Colin, and <laughs> I'm a City that. Club member. Um, you know, there's been such a, a flurry of suggestions and ideas and recommendations and things that nonprofits can be doing and others, and I'm just really conscious of the fact that many nonprofit organizations, even the largest ones, don't have a ton of sort of excess resource or excess time. And so I'm wondering for each of you, sort of number one thing, like what is the most important thing a nonprofit could do um, if, they can, if they only have the bandwidth for one sort of emergency preparedness action. Um, and then I'd ask, what's you the one thing notes. that, oh, great. <laughs> That's um, a great question. What's the one thing that funders can do, whether those are government funders or foundations? One each. Oh, goodness. The one, the one thing I, that I think is. nonprofits could do and the one thing that funders. Well, the one thing that nonprofits can do is just um, really dial in who and why they're going to serve a given population. And um, funders just need, really need to step up and fund mm -hmm. and see this as a priority. I don't think it's more mm -hmm. complicated than that. <laughs> One of the things that Jim mentioned is just that oftentimes when you do get contracts or funding, it doesn't include anything about emergency planning. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a piece there that allows you to do emergency planning or supports that. I think I said this in one of my answers, but it, for me it's about continuous improvement. It's about leveraging those events that happen and taking those lessons learned and putting yourself in a better position the next time something similar happens. Um, and that could be as simple as a conversation, but sometimes it also means you got to buy something. Yeah, I mean, just to jump in here, this is Jim. Um, the, um, we, we found in the report that um, less than 30% of the nonprofits who responded had a plan for continuing their operations after an emergency. So just that basic planning on what would they do and do they understand the asset that they are in the community. The other thing that I, I would just say a very easy thing and, and it goes to this you know, continuous improvement issue is just even training. Writing a plan is you know, we in the nonprofit sector do a lot of strategic planning. And then those things, unfortunately, too many times sit on a shelf and no one uses them. Writing a continuity plan or an emergency plan and not training on it, not using it, means that you will not be able to actually implement it. And it has been my unfortunate experience multiple times that when someone was killed, when someone was taken hostage, when there was a catastrophic emergency I had to respond to, I wasn't there if I was the boss, or my boss wasn't there and I was the one stuck dealing with it. And it was because we had both planned and trained on it that we were able to mitigate the impact of that emergency more quickly and with less trauma than would have happened. So training is absolutely paramount. I just want to say, since I've been working with the city's continuity of planning for the last couple of years, we have those plans in place now, and what is supposed to be happening is training. And as, as I was 
trying to support the bureaus in coming up with these um, plans, I thought, wow, I would just love to see an example of someone who's used their plan. And so I, we tried to reach out to Houston and to these other cities where, that certainly had plans and certainly must have used them. But what we really find is a lot that people don't consult their plans. And we did find, we have a great example here locally, which is the National Weather Service had a fire in their building. They trained on their continuity plan all the time because uh, they have these software updates and so they have to, Seattle has to take over from Portland and Redmond has to take over like that. They had um, a fire, had to evacu evacuate their building, were out for several weeks and did not miss a trick. They sent people to Seattle and uh, you, you didn't know any difference in terms of National Weather Service. So we do have that example. Wait, but. So um, I would say this is not a battle you have to fight alone. You have other organizations that you can reach out to. And money is a big, big deal and I don't want to minimize that. You also have non-financial requests you can make. Donate to us a, a generator. You know, how about food that we can stockpile? Um, so that's, and then the second piece to your question, for foundations to recognize that p disaster preparedness is about, is really capacity building. Instead of waiting to, for, the, for the thing to happen, and then, oh yeah, now we have money to give you. How mm -hmm. about you help us bolster in our resilience now so that we're in a better place to be able to respond. You might actually end up giving us less money and lesser investment after the fact. That's a great point, Grace. Thanks. Hi, Dan. <clears throat> Dan Valliere, City Club member. And I work for a nonprofit called REACH that does affordable housing. And a board member of REACH is here, Edward Knightley. And he had a question, which was, um, you know, often nonprofits may even do the right things, communicate well to uh, clients about things to do, but some of the most important things are about, you know, emergency kit and acquiring certain things to be ready. Well, you know, people without resources, that might be hard to do to acquire or maintain those things. So are there any models for how to be on telling people to do that for, for the public sector or even for private philanthropy to somehow support individuals to actually be prepared in that way? Or are there models for um, funding that kind of advice that we give to people with low incomes? Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'll tell you a little about sort of my emergency kit. Um, there are two liter bottles that have been sort of filled with water that are stuffed in portions of my house. There's no food that I don't buy that's freeze dry that's going to be there for 10 years. It's stuff that I buy normally. I wait for it to be on sale at sort of Safeway. Um, uh, you know, if you looked at my kit, I did not go out and buy something specialized. I have just found ways to find very, very inexpensive things and things that I use all the time, and that's what my kit looks like. And I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people think very specialized and are purchasing things for this one thing and thought, no, I'm just, I've just expanded what I use every day and there's just a little bit more of it sitting on the shelf. So I think that's a great, uh, you know, cost saver. Okay. You know, it, it's, a, it's a great question um, and I, a challenging one, I think. Um, at, at the panel that we had uh, last week, one of the issues was exactly what you were pointing out, pointing out that you know, for a family that doesn't know what they're going to eat today, how can then we expect them to stockpile? That doesn't make any sense at all. I think maybe part of the solution is at the community level. And, and unfortunately, you know, for us in the de you know, developed world, we no longer trust our neighbors. Uh, we don't, I don't even know my neighbors, and I'll be first to admit. Um, how then can we get for us to go back to community resilience? And I mean community in every sense, you know, where are we interact with our neighbors. And my neighbors know what it is that's missing. They know something about me that in the event of a disaster, they're going to look out for me. Or they know about that gentleman across the street who is diabetic or who, you know, those kinds of things. I don't have an answer, but I think if we can go back to that, and if nonprofits can be a part of communicating, not communicating, encouraging that, um, houses of worship can be a part of encouraging that, where we're looking at each other and supporting each other at that level. I think that's, that's because I mean, at the, at the end of the day, when disaster happens, we are the first responders, right? And I think the rule was, well, maybe three days they will come, 
and then it went to two weeks they'll come and I, I Puerto Rico is not saying two weeks anymore I, I, I agree wholeheartedly um, after Katrina the, the rule was hey in three days the cavalry would be there remember the cavalry didn't get there in three days and and so that that model unraveled a little bit uh, but I would say you're right in that I think the question that everybody needs to sometimes be asking is like what I can I do during this emergency I talked about that modeling where hey the prediction is that we're gonna have 90,000 people that show up in our shelters well, guess what? If you've got the one house on your property that is very, very viable, that's a time to sort of knock on your neighbor's doors and let them into your home because you know what? You probably be able to do a better, you might be in a better position to sort of care for them and they'd be in their own community than them coming towards one of our very, very large shelter villages and us providing them services. And then the people that do come to those locations, we could provide even better care for them because there's fewer people that we need to sort of address. So everybody needs to be asking themselves, how do I reduce that burden and sometimes allow, you know, government or other organizations or whether they're even the nonprofits to focus on the few people that have access to nothing else and need that service even more. There is a program called Map Your Neighborhood, which I think is a federal program and the nets are thinking about it and integrating it in to, to solve the problem that um, you, that you, wherever you went, that you mentioned. <laughs> One last question. John Hutzler, forum member. Um, in, uh, in the same vein as the comment that was just made about how can you ask a family that's, that, that has trouble feeding itself to stockpile, how, how can we ask nonprofits that are dealing with a current health and human services crisis to devote resources to planning for a potential future crisis. I mean, do, do, we really, do we really want to ask a food bank that doesn't have enough food to serve the hungry to stockpile food so that they will have food in the event of an earthquake? Mm -hmm. you know, and one of the questions we asked was uh, for nonprofits to identify the challenges that they're, they're facing in preparedness. Um, limited staff and volunteers was one, lack of financial resources uh, was another, competing urgent demands. I mean, they're more focused on how are we gonna bring in money to be able to provide services for our current uh, clients to, for today. And, and that, that was probably the third most um, challenge that they faced. And then the non-immediacy of the disaster. I mean, in Portland, I think the one of, I mean, we faced fires, and I think some communities faced that more than others in, in Oregon, I mean. And then we have the snowstorm, which by Wisconsin standards is a flurry, you know, but it's a big deal for us. You we know. can tell where you came from. <laughs> <laughs> totally, you know. So um, a, a fantastic point. Yeah. Thank you, and that is a great way to wrap up the panel. Grace, that is a good ending. Let me turn this over to... Thank you very much. Our time is up and we'll have to pause the conversation for now. Please join me in thanking Bobby Regan for producing today's program and Castleton for serving as our moderator and our guests for helping us understand the critical importance. Thank you.